set aside for the worship of Christ. What a blessed people we are, more than we can imagine. Grace is so real. Mercy is so real. Your kindness to us is so real. Help us to experience some of that now, even as we look at healthy doctrines, good doctrines from your word, as they are contained in the 1689. In Christ's name, amen. So chapter 4 of the Confession, if you're there with me, I'll be reading paragraph 1 now. In the beginning, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was pleased to create or make the world and all things in it, both visible and invisible, in a six-day period. And all very good. He did this to manifest the glory of His eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. So right at the gate, you see that the Puritan stream of thought, the Reformed stream of thought, they were six-day creationists. This would have been consistent with what we... uh, Is that the... Yeah, it is the speakers. It would have been consistent with what would have been prevalent in that time. So anyone wants to say that the historical position of the church was a position of... Let me just do that for now. Was a position of uh, what would they call day-aged, where they think there's a bunch of eons between the days and it's a long creation or old earth creation. No, the the reformers would have been truly... um, Six-day creationists, literal six-day creationists, short, uh, young earth, they would have been affirming what we would affirm now. even, um, And they wouldn't let you know, any type of intellectual thought or intellectual prowess overtake their view of creation. So in the beginning, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity were involved in the creation of the world and all things in it, both visible and invisible. Now that means a lot to us today, more than we probably realize, visible and invisible. Why? Because the prevalent stream of thought in our day is called materialism. Only that with which that you can touch, feel, only that is truly existing. Materialism, right? So they would hold, the atheists would hold to materialism as saying, if you can't touch it, then it doesn't exist. If you can't feel it, then it doesn't exist. And they do that primarily for what? To try to discredit the person of God and to say that he does not exist. So both visible and invisible, both creation, as you can see, in the mountains and the oceans and things of that nature, but also invisible things, like logic, like consistency of thought, like a a world that is consistent, a world that is being carried to and fro. So invisible is all those things that make up what is, listen, necessary for intelligibility. What does that mean? It means that God is the one who's sustaining the earth. Right? They often say when when an atheist shows up to a debate, to have a debate with a Christian, they've already lost. Because they showed up expecting what? Seven o'clock to remain seven o'clock? They expected expected to find someone that, that would understand their language? Well, in your random world of immaterial chance, why did nothing change? Why did you expect language to be the same? Why did you expect a logic to be the same, the law of non-contradiction to be the same? Why did you expect to show up tomorrow to a world that was like the one you fell asleep in? Because the atheist is not able to consistently live his worldview. And the confession has this so beautifully written out for us that our God had created the world and all things in it, both visible and invisible, in a six-day period and all very good. Let me pause real quick on this very good aspect. There's a stream of thought in Christianity that says that the things of this world are evil. That the things of creation are somehow sinful for Christians to partake in. Right? Because they're the things of the world. But when you see the creation story, God created all things very good. He looked out, it was very good. Right? So we have to not throw away the baby with the bathwater. Yes, this world is, uh, is marred with sin. Yes, there's a groaning of the world. Yes, there's things that are truly worldly and ungodly. But... Christians should be the ones who enjoy this world the most. Because this world is our Father's world. This creation is our Father's creation. So as we live in this world, as we enjoy creation, as we have fun and recreation, as we enjoy good food, good drink, what's that rooted in? It's rooted in the fact that God created this world very good. Very good. Let's not be dualists who see this world as something else and then the church as something else. No, it's all under the kingdom of Christ. Let's move on to paragraph 2. After God made all other creatures, He created humanity. He made them male and female, with rational and immortal souls, 
thereby making them suited to that life lived under God for which they were created. They were made in the image of God, being endowed with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. They had the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it. Even so, they could still transgress the law because they were left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject to change. All this is saying is, when God created man and woman, Adam and Eve, He created them with what we'd call, what they called, you know, big theologians, the posse peccari, the ability to sin, right? Even though they were upright, they were they were uh, true holy, right? They were true holiness, meaning that they were truly set aside, distinct from the creation, distinct from the animals. They were truly a special people made in the image of God. Nothing else was made in the image of God. They were rational. They were, they're immortal. Truly, everyone is immortal once they are created. They're not eternal, but they are immortal. You don't die, right? Your soul lives forever. And this is from the get-go. So, man and woman were created with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. They had the law of God written on their heart. That's why you can go to the most remotest parts of the world, and there's still semblance of morality that's never been taught. If I go to a tribe in the middle of nowhere, and I try to steal something from them, why are they offended by that? Because the law is written on their heart. Right? And the more suppressed it is, obviously, the more they're going to suppress the law of God and they begin to do ungodly things. But by and large, humanity has the law of God written on the hearts. Now it's marred because of the fall. Now it's skewed because of the fall. But you even see something in, in, in law schools that is called natural law. And they basically base natural law on God's law, but they want to say natural because they just came about naturally through man's consciousness, through man's experiences. This is what we decided was good and bad. Da, 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 da. It's not, not natural law. It's actually supernatural law that God has written on the hearts of his people. Let's go to verse, chapter 3, sorry. Paragraph 3. In addition to the law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As long as they obeyed this command, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. So there's something that's called po positive law, right? So you have that which was already written on their hearts, that which they possessed as being image bearers of God. But there's something called positive law, and that's something that's learned. It's, supposed, it's imposed upon. Let me try to give us a modern day example of this, right? A positive law is something that you might not be able to go to the scriptures to find. But is it still the case? Right? I don't see anything in creation forbidding Adam and Eve to do things that you see in Exodus, things that you see in Leviticus. Why? Because those positive laws weren't added yet. But undergirding all positive law is the moral law of God. Right? Undergirding what Adam and Eve were supposed to do in the, in, in the garden is the law of God written on their hearts. So that's why every question reality, in reality is a morality question. Everything. Am I honoring God? Am I following His will? Is there any immoral thing in what I'm doing, even though there's no express law about it? So this is a very, very healthy view of the liberty of conscience because it's our liberty of conscience to make those decisions about which laws, though there's no Bible verse to point to and look at and say, oh, it says we can't do this. But our moral law that's written on our hearts, especially as redeemed individuals, will guide us on these things. Let me just say something over that. You should never violate your own conscience to do anything. What, what do I mean by that? Our consciences are kind of being formed and shaped day by day. So if there's a situation where someone is asking you to do something and you feel as though that is violating your conscience to do that thing, even though you have the freedom to do that thing, if you give in to that thing, you are literally searing your own conscience and so next time, guess what? Your conscience is a little numb. And then next time, it's a little bit more numb. And then, lo and behold, three months later, you're doing things you never would have thought your conscience would have allowed you to do. This is what we've seen in society called social conditioning. right? They just try to push you just enough to say, okay, it's not that big of a deal. I'll just numb my conscience for, real, for, for this one time. Then they just nudge you a little bit more. Okay, just another one more thing. I, I'll, just nudge my con I'll just numb my conscience a little bit. I, I won't give into it. I'll just... And you keep on ignoring your conscience. Keep on ignoring your conscience. And then... Lo and behold, six months later, again, your conscience is gone. That's why Paul would say things like, oh, I've checked my conscience and my conscience is clear. 
or, or he, would, he would say things, no, my conscience is clean on this matter. So God has given you a conscience that's rooted in the law of God right on your heart. Listen to it, especially as a redeemed individual, especially when you're in his word, especially when you're praying. Don't ignore that conscience that God has given you. So there's doctrine of creation. You know, so many times we look at the Garden of Eden and we think, oh, like what, what, a, what a hard situation to be in. Adam and Eve having to carry the weight of responsibility of humanity. And we paint the Garden of Eden as almost like this angry boss who's just waiting for his employees to mess up. Did he eat the fruit today? Like, did he actually eat the fruit today? Well, let's watch him because he's getting close to the fruit. That's not what the Garden of Eden was like, guys. It was a father and children relationship. Remember, they walked together in the cool of the day. It was for their good. They enjoyed all the things. They had dominion over the creatures. Adam and Eve would have enjoyed a true, beautiful relationship with one another. So when we look back at the Garden of Eden, don't first think the fall. First think the pleasures of God that he's given man and woman to enjoy. And now, as Adam was called to extend the Garden of Eden to the end of the earth, and he failed to do so, well, Christ comes and he tells his people what? Extend the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. And then you go to Revelation, and what do we see there? Garden-like language. A paradise to enjoy. So we must realize the original intent of the garden has not been thrown away. It's restored in Christianity. As now we become sons and daughters of Christ and we become truly his brothers and his sisters and we try to advance his kingdom, what we're trying to do is get back to paradise and bring others along the way. And we enjoy life, we enjoy his creation, we honor our consciences and we look up to heaven and say, this isn't burdensome, we have a good God and a good Father who loves us. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Nice and short little chapter on creation here. No. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that you created a people, Lord. You created humanity in a good garden, in a paradise. You created us to enjoy it. Yes, we know Adam and Eve failed. Yes, we know Adam himself was the one who brought the curse into the world by which we are all a part of now. But Lord, just as you promised a seed for Eve, that proto-evangelion, Lord, where Christ would come and crush the head of the serpent, what do we see on Mount Golgotha, called the head, the, 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 the mountain of the skull, where Christ is being torn to pieces, where he's hanging there dying, where his heel is truly, truly pierced. Just as it said in Genesis, that the, the, saint, the seed of the Satan would bruise his heel. But Christ, on the skull, on the mountain of the skull, Lord, crushes the head of the serpent. And he restores all that was originally designed. There was no death in the garden. And now we as Christians, we say, Oh, death, where is your sting? There was no no sense of, of a condemnation in the, before the fall in the garden. Now we as Christians say, oh, there's no condemnation in Christ. Lord, let us, let us, help us to see, Lord, that we are truly vice regents now. That just as Adam was called to extend the kingdom, we're called to extend that kingdom. Just as Adam was called to have dominion over culture, that's what we're called to do. Just as Adam was to be fruitful and multiply, that's what we're called to do, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord. In Christ's name, amen. You're dismissed.